two years ago, Americans watched in horror as a crisis unfolded at the Kabul airport. There's desperation and anguish. More than 80,000 Afghans have since arrived in America. But this story is still unfolding. I'm Andrea Smartin. In my new podcast, Stranger Becomes Neighbor, we'll find out what happens to these new arrivals in our communities. Who would help our newest neighbors? Follow us at kslpodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you listen. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, I wasn't quite sure what to expect as far as uh, how many people would come. Uh, I do have some uh, remarks and slides uh, that we're going to talk about today, but mostly I'm excited to get to the point where we can answer questions here in a little bit. Um, I thought, how am I going to start? We got a lot of feedback on that. Um, there we go. I'm not going to, 280 HD, I can't handle that for a whole hour. Um, last Friday, so one of the things I do, I'm a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry, and if any of you are thinking of becoming a psychologist, it's a pretty good job. If, you, if you're a psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry, nobody knows what you're supposed to do because they just assume you're there doing what you're supposed to do. It works out really well. My dad still once in a while asks me, like, what's the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist, even though I've done this for a while. Anybody know? Nobody knows. Yes, drugs and no drugs. Thank you. So I, uh, I am a no-drug guy. Uh, I work in a department of psychiatry, which are medical doctors, and one of my very favorite things I get to do is uh, lecture with my residents. And the best part of it is they're not undergraduates, so I don't have to test them or grade anything. They just have to show up and tolerate me for certain periods of time. And last Friday, we had just wrapped up uh, a, let's see, a four-week lecture series on cognitive behavioral therapy with children and adolescents. And it's a lot of fun. You get to work with some of these really bright um, medical residents that ask a lot of really neat questions. And we were wrapping up and uh, putting our stuff away and kind of on that post-academic high. No? Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm a nerd when it comes to that. And one of the residents who had been really into the discussion said to me, he's like, wow, you know, I didn't realize that working with kids and adults, or as kids and adolescents was so different than working with adults. And I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, man, you have to have a lot of energy to work with them, and, um, and you have to have patience, a lot of creativity, because we talked about you know, not just sitting down but talking. You have to ask uh, creative questions, bring things down to their level, um, all these sorts of different things you have to do with kids. And I said, yeah. He said, man, I'm glad I just work with adults. That's a lot of work. See ya. And he bounced out of there. And I kind of was like, huh, that's true. That's why I'm tired all the time. I guess, and so I kind of Charlie Browned my way back to my car and was thinking about that as I was driving to my office, and then I realized actually all those things he said were the good stuff of working with kids and teens. Uh, during, uh, you know, us old people, we need therapy too and all of that, but when you work with kids and adolescents, you get to work with them during developmental periods of time in their life, and I think that that's one of the things I want to emphasize tonight is we can make interventions as parents uh, during those times when kids are learning patterns of thinking and patterns of behavior that have to do with uh, how they see the world. They can help us insulate them from anxiety, depression, and suicidal thinking. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Apparently, we're going to talk a lot about screen time today, too. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about screen time. I will say it's sort of the bane of my existence, because everybody here came with the question, how much screen time should my kid have? And then they're going to go home and say, Dr. Matt said, and that every kid hates me, right? So we'll see. But we will talk about, I have a compromise on that. Um, a little bit about uh, how serious the issues are, uh, some warning signs, things that you can do as a parent, and some protective factors. We have some resources outside, and I'll have a few listed up on the screen. Um, just to kind of set the stage, anxiety and depression has been uh, increased. The diagnosis of these have increased over time. There are probably a couple different reasons for that. One is we get better at measuring things over time. So there could be a little bit of falseness to that. But more likely, the increase in anxiety and depression in adolescents and children over time reflects the, some of the changes that kids deal with that we didn't deal with growing up. You can see here that across the United States, 
We have uh, kids uh, and adolescents where anxiety and depression is significant, with anxiety being a little more than twice as common as depression. And this stat, I know we're here at Teen Talk, but I'm including kids here for a reason because of this next slide. One of the things I want you to notice is that um, as kids get older, there's a dramatic increase in the diagnosis of anxiety and depression. If you notice that children preschool and elementary age uh, contribute only a small portion of the variance in depression, a little bit more in anxiety, but when they get into their adolescent years, you can see that that uh, accounts for the majority of anxiety and depression diagnoses in our youth. So that's, that's significant for those of us who are raising teenagers. Oh, I meant to mention I have a few of them. Uh, I, have a th I have three boys and a girl. One of them finally hit 21, but still lives at home, I know. So I have a 21, 18, and 16-year-old, and then a 13-year-old. And unfortunately, my 13-year-old, my daughter, is really cute, which is a whole set of problems I wasn't prepared for. Um, average looking would have been better. Um, the final uh, stat down there are behavioral disorders, and you see there's a different correlation there. So what we want to do is look at anxiety and depression are what we call internalizing disorders. Those are issues of thoughts and feelings that have to do with patterns of anxiety and feelings of depression, whereas behavior disorders are higher in the elementary school age where kids are acting out more. And one of the theories there is that as kids' anxiety and depression increases, their acting out can decrease in certain ways that are traditionally considered behavioral problems, but present themselves in other ways uh, as well. How are we doing in Utah? So for, high, uh, for teenagers 12 to 17, in Utah, when it comes to, um, wow, it's really high up there, isn't it? Um, when it comes to major depressive episodes. And so I'll just, I'll just answer your question right now. This is not bummed out. This is not moody teenager stuff. This stat reflects an actual major depressive episode, which is serious and not normal for a teenager. And we're about on par with the country um, with 14%. It's still too high, but uh, when it comes to something that comes from major depressive episodes, suicidal thinking, we unfortunately are quite a bit higher than the national average. With 22% versus 17 across the board, those are boys and girls ages 12 to 17. Uh, actually, this is the high school stat, so it's a little truncated with about 14 to 17 in the age group. So yes, there is a problem, and no, we're not immune to it here in Utah. Um, screen time. Okay, we're going to jump right in tackle screen time. Now, here's something that uh, there's been a lot of recent research on screen time. And thankfully, the good research is evolving in how we talk about screen time and understand it. One of the old ways to look at it is uh, screen time all day long, how much is okay for your kids. Nowadays, if you're looking at a statistic, if you're reading an article on this, try to determine if they're talking about uh, uh, recreational screen time or all screen time. How many, uh, I see that we got some youngins, some kids here in the audience. How many of you use screens during the day for school or school related stuff or stuff you wish you weren't doing? Yeah? Okay, those of you that weren't raising your hands are probably anxious. I think it's everybody, right? Like, I mean, you're always using screens. So there has to be uh, a delineation there. But a pretty typical statistic looks a little bit like this, that the, the more screen time during the day that's recreational, the more we have an increase in uh, depressive thoughts and suicidal related thoughts, uh, thoughts and actions. One thing I'd like to bring your attention to is this. It looks awful and I almost pulled this out, but I really like graphs, okay? And this one has color and everything. And so one of the things I wanna bring parents' attention to is what's called the Goldilocks effect. And over the last two to three years, there have been several studies that explore this idea of the just right amount of screen time. And again, we are talking about recreational screen time here. One of the things that you'll see is that the different colors represent orange is TV and movies, video games are red, computers are green, smartphones are blue. That's kind of hard because you can do gaming on almost all of those. Weekdays are the solid and weekends are the dots but they all tell the same tale. 
which is below one hour per day, kids are actually reporting lower mental health or more depression. At about one to two hours of recreational use per day is kind of that sweet spot or the Goldilocks effect. It's just right. And then every hour after that, just like in the previous study, we start to see that kids are reporting, teenagers are reporting their mood going down and having higher rates of depression as the day goes on. And five hours is kind of a cutoff time for a lot of research. So any thoughts about why this would be? Seems kind of interesting, right? It's not old school. Old school would be, oh, we're all going to be happier without screens. Well, this is one of those evolutions in uh, the culture that I think we need to pay attention to as parents. And that is that a lot of this recreational screen time has to do with an adolescent's connection with other people, uh, their peers. And during adolescence, that's a really important activity of learning how to build your identity, connect with others, feel independent. And so what we are seeing is kids that aren't getting any of that or less than an hour of that may actually feel more disconnected from their peers. They're not playing online uh, with each other. They're not having things to talk about, you know, the next day at school. And so there is that sweet spot where it seems to be just right if kids are having about one to two hours of recreational screen time per day. Interesting. Plus, it's a cool name. I'll tell you what I tell people. I think balance is really the key. There's a lot of research. Um, you know, American Association of Pediatrics is very conservative. Uh, other associations might be a little bit more liberal. But the reality is, I think that in my practice, kids that seem to be doing the best have parents who are purposefully creating balance in their life. So a little bit of screen time, we can see with this Goldilocks effect, is probably important for kids to have. We're also finding that kids who have balance, are they, instead of just asking how many minutes of screen time should my kid have every day, you might ask yourself, in what's the balance between screen time every day and other things that include physical activity, creative activity, reading, yep, actual books like with paper and stuff, they still have those. Um, what are some of the things that they're doing? I guess another thing that I didn't put up here is just unstructured time, which often leads to some of these other activities, being active, being outside. If my kids were here and they're glad they're not, um, they, they would know that dad always says, go do something with wheels. That was, that was what I liked doing growing up. Something with wheels on it. Go do something with wheels on it. Anyway, balance. I think balance is the key. We kind of got an idea of how much time is good, but balance is also important. Don't just focus on minutes. Let's try to focus on what else they're doing. Um, I want to empower you guys a little bit with some, some things to notice, and then we're going to get down to some parenting tips. But there are warning signs for depression, and they may not necessarily be what you think of when you think of depression. Uh, teenagers are often, uh, some, they certainly can be sad, stay in bed, pull the covers over your head kind of stuff. But the reality is a lot of times it's irritability, it's acting out, it's um, feeling frustrated, and major changes in any regular routine that they have can be something that you as a parent should pay close attention to. Did I miss any other good ones? Um, negative self-talk. A little bit of that's probably normal for um, most teenagers, and it may be something that you're modeling if you are. Don't. So negative self-talk, uh, but if it's real pessimistic, self-deprecating, and especially, again, if that's a real change from their typical way of talking about themselves, then that's something to pay attention to. Um, I want to talk about associated reasons for suicide. Now, I like what Dave said, and that was, uh, in the past, people didn't talk about suicide that much. Is that a fun topic to talk about? No. But it is a topic that, when we talk about things, we, we have power to discuss it, connect with others, and make a change, make a difference. And frankly, one of the things that I'm really concerned about uh, for our youth in Utah is the high rates of suicidal thinking and actions. Uh, it's too high, and I think part of that is because we're a little bit behind in how much we discuss suicide and depression and related issues. And that's changing a lot, thanks to people like KSL and other uh, organizations in our state. We are talking about it more. 
Talking isn't the end-all, be-all, but if you can't talk about something, you can't understand it, and if you can't understand it, then you really can't work on it. You can't improve it. And so I appreciate the fact, the opportunity to talk about this. Um, what do we want to see? <laughs> Depression and or a mental health issue. If your teenager has a mental health issue or are, they're struggling with some sort of substance abuse, those are the big ones. If uh, they've already had issues with depression and that we need to make sure that in the home you're having opportunities to discuss and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, big stressful life events uh, that kind of come suddenly. Uh, some of the common ones are what? Uh, divorce, ch uh, loss of a job, sudden moving, uh, health issues. Um, you know, a parent who has become ill, those sorts of things are things to pay attention to. And even though you may have a lot on your plate as a family during those times, making sure you're having open conversations and dialogues with your kids is also really important. Um, I want to make, I want to pause here for a second. This one I almost threw out as well because I don't want to give the wrong idea. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, uh, but the reality is I would assume that almost everyone in this room has had some unfortunate association with suicide in some form or another. Uh, my first one was right after high school graduation. And uh, when I was a little kid, a young kid, junior high age, uh, I moved from Orange County, California to Morgan, Utah. So that's my trauma story. Um, no, it, it turned out to be great for me, but I'll be honest, the first year or two was a little rough. Right? I didn't, own, I didn't know what ropers were. Does anybody know what ropers are? They're boots, wranglers, belt buckles the size of a plate. Didn't have one of those. Um, but I moved to Morgan, and a, good, uh, a couple kids really befriended me. And one of those kids we stayed, you know, it's Morgan, so you can't really avoid people. But we stayed friends over the years. And right after high school, during that time when people are getting ready to decide where they're going and what they're doing, uh, he committed suicide. And... I remember having a strange reaction to that. I didn't quite get it. It was a bizarre thing to me. Um, I remember sort of talking about it with some of our friends, and we all didn't know what to say, and so we didn't really say much. And to be honest, I just kind of stuffed that down for a lot of years. Didn't understand why he did it. Still don't understand why he did it. There are warning signs, but I don't want anybody in the room today to think that you should be able to predict suicide all the time. That's one of the things that's very hurtful and hard for people who are survivors. If you have a friend or a family member who has committed suicide, there are warning signs, and we should try to see them. But don't blame yourself if you have a friend or a loved one who has committed suicide and you, you couldn't tell. That's one of the worst things to go back afterwards and try to figure out where you missed it. Because one of the things we know from research in suicide, and it is a complicated field, because there are so many reasons why suicide may happen, but it's hard to always know, and we think right now probably we can't always know. But that being said, as a parent, it doesn't feel good to not have power. Again, major changes in certain things. Uh, sometimes it has to do with some of the basics, like sleeping and eating, uh, going to school. Um, anhedonia is a term that we use where it's a loss of pleasure, things that used to be really important and fun, not just a normal shift, but kind of a general malaise about things uh, that used to be fun and interesting to your child would be something to take note of. Um, joking about suicide. They used to think that maybe people who joked about suicide uh, were not suicidal, and we know that that's actually quite the opposite. Having it on one's mind, thinking about it, uh, and that's an opportunity if you hear some of those things come out of your kids' mouths to have an opportunity to talk about it and help explore where they're at with that. Um, we don't want to skip anxiety since it's actually <laughs> a more prevalent issue. And anxiety functions in an interesting way. Anxiety, especially chronic anxiety from childhood on, can be exhausting. And it can wear a person down to where depression co-occurs uh, with anxiety. Depression can be its own problem, but if you have a child with anxiety, um, they're at, I think, about 60 to 70% higher risk of also having depression because if you've ever been anxious, 
having anxiety is miserable, and having chronic anxiety is exhausting. And over time, you start to feel discouraged and pessimistic, and that can be something where depression can kind of creep in. So please pay attention to things like somatic complaints. Um, you know, my stomach hurts, my head hurts, I'm dizzy. Those, now, I'll dispel some of those rumors. Hopefully, most of us understand. A person with anxiety who's complaining of a stomach ache actually has a stomach ache, okay? They really do. Their stomach actually hurts, but we call it psychogenic, as opposed to it being due to a bacteria or something else. Uh, they are having actual stomach pains. So it's a good way to know that if we can get in, if we're having chronic issues in, in bodily problems, but there isn't an obvious answer, anxiety may be the cause. Um, restless, fidgety, hyperactive, that's me. Uh, sleep problems is a big one. Uh, avoidance of social activities. So a lot of people don't realize that for a teenager, your social life and developing connections with other people is one of the main developmental needs. But if that teenager is also really struggling to do that, then they're caught in this middle place. It's very difficult and upsetting. And so anxiety should be something that we pay attention to. Irrational or atypical worries. Um, those would include things like, um, you know, mom went to the store to get some groceries and they're convinced that mom will never come back because she was in an accident. You know, those sorts of things are atypical. We don't typically worry about them, which I guess is the definition of atypical, huh? All right, teen development, what drives them? There are some good looking teens right there. They're all happy. Um, I do want to talk for a minute about my favorite thing. I could keep you for an hour. We could talk about uh, developmental issues. That's one of my favorite things to teach my residents and to talk about. And I do think that it's essential to understand developmental uh, periods and tasks to understand what is driving your teenager's behavior. Um, my daughter, who's 13, used to love to hang out with me. I was so cool a couple years ago. A lot of fun to do things with. We would go skateboarding together and go to the movies together. And she still loves to do all those things, just not with me. And uh, one of the things that kids are doing in their adolescence, the main thing is identity. I've thrown up a little graphic here. Um, some of you probably did Eric Erickson in... Uh, undergraduate, right? But identity development really is where it's at. The question is, you know, who am I? Who am I becoming? One of my favorite graduate school mentors used to say, teenagers try on personalities like jackets. It's, it's like a different personality every day. You know, I'm a cool kid. I'm a smart kid. I'm a punk rock. I don't know what kids are these days. But that's one of the things that you'll see kids doing all the time is experimenting with identity development. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So one of the main parts of our conversation in, in the community nowadays is gender identity. That is a very important part of one's identity. People who kind of went with the typical flow and didn't have that as an issue don't understand how challenging that is for a person. But our, our identity, sexuality, and gender are definitely developing strongly along with personality traits and other things during adolescence. And so, again, it's one of those things that, as a parent, we may not feel completely comfortable talking about, but we need to get comfortable so that our teenagers have a place where they can come and talk to us about that. So, yeah, I appreciate that. I said I don't get kids today, but that was my way of just skipping on. So, you know, you guys are scary. Um, what do we want to talk about here? Independence is another one. So why do we bring this up? Independence, identity, um, because your, kid, your teenagers are going to do screwy stuff that really annoys you. And a good way to filter that stuff is to ask yourself, can I see how somehow what they're doing is part of this identity, independence sort of uh, development? It might help us as we interact with them. It's interesting, some of us have an easy time remembering our adolescence, and many of us, I find, don't remember our own adolescence. And sometimes that's helpful, sometimes it's not. Uh, our adolescence is going to be a little different um, than our kids' adolescence. I keep having a thought that's like circling. I'm just going to skip it. 
Moving on. Um, okay, here's the main part of what I want to talk about tonight. Here are some techniques that I want you to understand. Uh, if you don't know what to do, communication with a teenager is one of the most important things. And I'm going to talk to you in sa the same way that I often talk one-on-one -on -one with parents. What can we do to connect with our teenagers? Uh, empathy. This is an oddly resisted <laughs> um, uh, communication tool, and, and I think I figured out why. A lot of parents, when I say, well, why don't we start with an empathy, they're confusing that with uh, agreement. Okay, so empathy in a communication way is a way of connecting with your teenager and telling them that you can identify somewhere, something about where they're at emotionally or behaviorally. It doesn't mean you necessarily agree with it. It doesn't mean that they're not going to lose the car for the next week or whatever it is. But empathy is a way of creating a connection with your teenager. We're gonna, we'll test me and see if I can use some of these in a role play in a second. Um, reflective listening. Anybody been to marriage therapy? You know what this is. Um, reflective listening. Not a single laugh in that. Nobody, it's not, I don't know, I thought that was funny. Um, validation and clarification are the two things that come out of uh, reflective listening. And reflective listening, have you ever been in a conversation where you're saying something important and you're looking the person in the eye and you can just tell they're waiting until you breathe so they can tell you what they're thinking? How, how invalidating is that? You're like telling them and they're just waiting for you to, and then they're going to bam, Right? That's what we do to our teenagers a lot. Reflective listening will help us not do that. Reflective listening is just like what it sounds like. So what you're telling me is X, Y, and Z. Is that right? Reflective listening sends a message that you are actually listening, and it's very validating. To you, whatever the teenager's telling you may not be that interesting. It may not, you may be very mad for some reason. But by stopping listening and asking for clarification, you help yourself and the teenager get on the same page. If nothing else, at least that helps you make your punishments more appropriate because you're on the same page with them, and that always feels good. Um, I statements. Emotional vocabulary is something that kids and teenagers really struggle with. So as a parent, it's important for you to try to use an I statement about your thoughts and feelings. Model that to them, and encourage. I encourage you to use words that are pretty specific. I'm really pissed off. Unless you're British and you've been at a pub, it's probably not applicable. That doesn't mean anything. It just kind of sends a message that you're mad, right? How about, I'm really frustrated. Oh, okay. Or I'm irritated, or I'm annoyed. So those are now we're modeling appropriate emotional vocabulary. Kids who have a higher emotional vocabulary have the ability to express themselves and therefore get their needs met and therefore have lower rates of depression and anxiety. Cool. Um, make it about their behavior and not about them. This should have started when they were little, but this is part of identity. There's a big difference between saying what you did is not okay and you are not okay. And I am kind of appalled at the number of parents that model to me that they say basically put downs to the kid. Really think about what you're upset about. If you need to talk to them, if you're concerned, try to make it about the behavior. The behavior should be trained and corrected and improved over time. That's our job as parents. But the person needs to be uh, unconditionally validated and loved for who they are, even if their behavior is a little out of whack. Okay? Um, my favorite, Socratic questioning. I do not want to keep solving their problems for them for the rest of their lives, and this is one of the very best ways to help with that creates critical thinking. You are older, smarter, wiser. You already know what to do. Tell the kid what to do, right? How well does that work? Not really. Nope. And you know what? You think it's better at my house? It's worse. Don't psychoanalyze me, Dad. Right? Yeah. I want to throw down every time I hear that. So, no, it's worse at my house. Socratic questioning is you know what you want to tell them you need to devise a question to help them think about that and say it first. And then you are in the sweet spot. All you have to say is, yeah, that sounds good. Socratic questioning, easier said than done, but we'll see if we can do an example of that in a minute. Uh, 
Let's do that right now. We're going to stop on these last two. So we're going to see if I can pull this off. The scenario is, uh, you're a good parent, so you set a, a curfew, I guess, for your kids. You want them home at midnight, okay? And your kid rolls in at 12.20, kind of brusts through the door. You're tired, right, because you're old, and you wanted to go to sleep like an hour ago. And they're all discombobulated, and they want to tell you, you know, what, oh, Dad, Dad you know, I, I really, you know, I, I know I'm late, and it's like the eighth time this week. But, you know, the truth is, I really, I had to take every, nobody else had a car. I had to take everybody home. And I have these great friends that live in Draper. And I didn't know you need a passport to actually get to Draper. It's that far away, you know. And so I would have been home on time. I'm really worried you're going to be mad at me. I'm really worried you're going to ground me because I have that date with that person tomorrow. And, you know, I just, I need the car, but I'm worried. Okay, right? And it's, no one's ever heard that before. Just the three drivers at my house. Okay. So, let's try it. Empathize. I'm ticked, right? Like, I've been waiting up eighth time this week, apparently, according to my current analogy. And uh, so I, but I want to empathize. I have to connect with uh, this kid, or it's just going to go south, and I'm already tired, and I just want to go to bed. So, empathy could be something like, you know what, Johnny, I can tell that you're really worried and upset that being late again is uh, going to get you in trouble. I, I can see that, that you're feeling pretty worried about that. That's empathy, right? I just, I'm acknowledging how they're feeling. I mean, it's not, it's not the best empathy. It's not a hug. Okay, so we're not going to hug tonight. He's in trouble. But, but this, is, this is a good way to make a connection, acknowledge where he or she is at tonight. Uh, reflective listening. So what you're telling me is that you were the only person there with a car, my bad, and you had to uh, drive everybody home so that they wouldn't be late for their curfews, thus making you late for your curfew. Is that about right? Did I get that right? Now, I still haven't given away my hand of cards yet. I've empathized, right? Uh, I've also done reflective listening, which should be validating. It's like, well, yeah, Dad took... I can see Dad's steaming mad, but uh, he uh, took a minute to listen to me. I feel validated. And then he asked me, uh, is that right? I could correct it. I could say, the teenager might be like, well, yeah, that, and I had a flat tire, and I got a ticket. Hopefully, that, we're not going there tonight. So let's just say, they say, yes, that's it. I took everybody home, and that made me late. Okay. Well, I'll have to tell you, I statement, I'm really frustrated. We've had this conversation several times this week, and honestly, I am tired. I feel frustrated. I really uh, am going to have to think about what we do from this point forward. So I've just modeled honesty, right? I'm not lying to the kid. I'm not saying it's okay when it's not okay. But now that we're on the same page with what happened, and we're a little bit connected, we can have a better conversation. Even I'm calming down at this point, right? Um, let's make it about their behavior, not them. A mistake would be to say, you are so irresponsible. That's a you statement, and it's about them. We're not going to raise irresponsible kids. We're going to raise kids that learn to be responsible. So we have to say something else. We have to say, you know, I feel like the way you handled this tonight uh, wasn't the most responsible. In fact, going back to I statements, I, uh, I'm still frustrated about the fact that you didn't let me know. Remember that thing that I pay for, that everyone tells me I shouldn't pay for, but I pay for it, it's in your pocket, it's about that big. Uh, I think it connects to more than YouTube. It has a texting service in it. And you could, uh, oh, but, whoa, 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 Matt almost blew it. You know, so I feel kind of frustrated that you didn't contact me ahead of time. We've, we've talked about this. You uh, just came in and told me right now. What do you think you could have done differently tonight? You're in trouble. There's going to be a consequence, but let's talk about it. Like, did you have any other options? Now, if you're my 16-year-old, Jake, he goes like, you know, whatever the nuclear codes are when I ask him this. I could have just told them all that I hate them and that they can get their own ride. <laughs> and that, you know, it's like, they're not good friends. That's what I would have said, Dad. I should have said that. I could have said that. Uh, yeah, Jake, that's what I want you to say. Make yourself the most unpopular guy in school. <clears throat> what else could you have done? I think that's a little much. Does anybody have that kid? 
my other two just did the deer in the headlights, and they know that I'm too hyperactive to stop talking, so they just do this. And then I would talk over them, so that's, don't do that. But Jake will go nuclear on it, and so um, I would say, well, yeah, that might be a little much. What about that thing, you know, A, T, and T, is it? What's in your pocket? Oh, yeah, I guess I could, you know. And so then he provides the answer to the, and you say, yes, that would have made a difference and, and probably decreased the time you're going to be without the car, whatever the consequence is. Um, how'd I do? Is it okay? All right. It gets better. Like, the first kid should be kind of an Android sort of robot thing that you can just, like, trade in and mess that one up. And then it gets a little bit better, I'm hoping. But with the daughter, that's throwing me a bit of a curve. So we'll see how that goes. Um, how many of you are busy parents? Uh-huh. Yep, everybody. One of the mistakes, I think dads are more guilty of this than moms, um, typically. I'm going to check our time real quick. Um, short, positive interactions. Dads often think, I never get to see my kid. I'm missing everything. I got to spend the whole weekend with them. We'll do all this fun stuff and spend money we don't have. And no, don't do that. The reality is there's good research on the value of short, positive interactions. Think of a lot of little bricks in a foundation. Okay, the bricks are these little short interactions where you're sending a specific message. I see you. I know what you like and I like you. I see you. I know what you like and I like you. For example, lacrosse. Any lacrosse players here? It's terrible, terrible lacrosse. I don't understand it. They've been playing it for years. I love soccer. Boys are playing lacrosse. Again, nobody cop to lacrosse. It's that bad, isn't it? Um, I'm kidding. I know you love lacrosse. Um, but I didn't know anything about lacrosse. One of the things that I've tried to do with Jake is tell him stuff I see about lacrosse and actually look for stuff that I see about lacrosse. And this will sound like a failure, but I'm going to turn it into a win. The other day, I was, saw something came up. I was working on my laptop, and it said something about, you know, a new uh, professional lacrosse league traveling around the country to teach people about lacrosse. And so I clicked on it, and I read about it. I said, hey, Jake, come here. Check this out. He walks over, and I said, hey, did you see this? There's uh, Paul Rabel. See, I know lacrosse. Uh, he started this new lacrosse league, and it's really cool, and it's traveling all over. We should try to go to a game or something. And he said, yeah, Dad, I already know about that. And he walked out, okay? So, fail, right? No. That's a short, positive interaction because I see Jake. He's there in the house. I'm interacting with him. I know something that he likes. He's insane for this sport of lacrosse that I have no eye-hand coordination for whatsoever. He loves it. Paul Rabel is his man. I guess he's like the Michael Jordan of lacrosse or something. And so by me pointing it out, what message did I send? I see you. I know what you like, and I like you. And then he kind of on me and left. But that's how it is when you have a teenager. And that's okay. That's all right. Mastery experiences, we probably don't have time to get way into this. Mastery experiences doesn't necessarily mean you've mastered something. But when parents say, how do kids get self-esteem? Is that even a real thing? Those of us who grew up in the 70s and 80s, and you got like a lavender ribbon for some bull crap you did. And you're just like, no, that's not self-esteem, right? Self-esteem is recognizing your role in a positive outcome. What we want to do as parents is look for opportunities to help kids connect with and take ownership for their roles in positive outcomes. For example, let's say your kid's no good at math. I'm kidding. They're less than average at math. And they're struggling in their math tests. They studied hard and they did better than usual. Let's say they got a B plus on their math test and they're usually a solid C math student. And now you have an opportunity to have a mastery experience. What's the first thing we usually do is we celebrate it, right? What do good parents do? Dude, you're the smartest kid in the world. It's so awesome. High five, knuckles, way to go. I don't know. We celebrate it. The kid feels happy. You feel happy. We're done. We have no idea if they had a mastery experience. Okay? That may not have loaded on their self-esteem at all. Do you know why? Because we don't know where they gave credit for that B+. That's important for you guys to understand. So after you celebrate and do all that stuff, you want to ask a very important golden question. How did that happen? Something like that. You'd normally have been getting kind of lower grades, you know. 
But you really put, I said B plus, that's pretty good. That's almost an A from what they tell me. That's a big improvement. How did that happen? And if your child gives an externalizing response, they did not have a mastery experience. Okay, I got lucky is probably the main culprit. Everybody did well. This test was easy. We have a great teacher. I cheated, no, not that one. Um, <laughs> those sorts of explanations show no ownership for the success. Therefore, no building of self-esteem or confidence. If they say that, you can rephrase and say, well, I'm glad it was a little bit of an easier test, and I guess luck happens a little bit, but I noticed you did some other things, Socratic parenting. What else did you do this week that was different? Well, since you took the car away, <laughs> I stayed home and I made flashcards and I studied. I don't know if kids have flashcards anymore. But um, I studied more. I said, you know, I noticed that. Do you think that had anything to do with it? Yeah, maybe that has something. I bet if you did that again, you'd probably keep those grades and math up. Way to go. Do you see the difference? A mastery experience happens just in a little second, but because we celebrate success and don't ask any further questions, we don't really know which kids are having mastery experiences and which aren't. And I'll tell you, my own kids, the two oldest, this was a real struggle for them and to some degree still is. Unfortunately, Jake just thinks he owns everything, so he's another problem. He's always like, I did it. Yeah, it was me. Um, so we're working on him from the other end of things. Um, let's see. As Dave said, we need to talk about suicide. Be direct. Use the real words. Talk to kids about suicide on a continuum because that's where it happens. At the low end of the continuum of thought might be escapism. I feel overwhelmed. Things are too hard. I don't want to be here anymore. That doesn't sound overly suicidal, but to be honest, that's starting down the pathway, and that might be as much as they're willing to open up and let you have right now. All the way up to kids having active thoughts about hurting themselves. Um, you can ask them about friends. Do your friends ever talk about it? Um, some of us, unfortunately, have kids who have gone to schools where suicides have happened. That is a really important time in that aftermath of a suicide in your community to talk with your kids about it. But also talking about things like hopelessness, helplessness, uh, pessimism. Those are at that lower end, but loading on the scale of something that could become active suicidal thinking. Um, protective factors. My favorite's the last one, pets. Uh, I didn't make any of these up. They're all based on research. Um, Restricted access to lethal means. I think we get it with the weapons. Um, if you have weapons in your home, I highly encourage you to lock them up and make it inaccessible even to your teenager. Um, if you like to go shooting or doing those sorts of things, still make it so that you're the one that has to be able to access those codes. The one where we usually get it wrong are the pills. Most of our homes are really dangerous and we don't realize it. It could be that you say, well, we don't have any surgeries, we don't have any opiates or anything like that in our house. But the reality is you might have that Costco-sized bottle of Tylenol. Okay? Those sorts of things should be locked up. With very few exceptions, I hope that you'll take seriously the opportunity to pause that impulsivity that comes with suicidal thinking. And hopefully by opening up a communication your kid will come and talk to you instead of impulsively reach for something that could be lethal. Um, I'm going to leave that up there. There are some good resources in our community um, that I hope uh, you'll take advantage of. One of my favorite is the Safe Utah app. There are some cards out on the table, and that gives us an opportunity to have a lot of different interactions as parents, as teenagers. Um, and that's where we're going to pause right now. I'm going to finish up this part of our section, give Debbie a minute, and then we'll do a Q&A. Thanks. Do Dr. Woolley, that was amazing. Um, just incredible. And what great insight and information that we can all use, all information we can use. Thank you so much. And let me remind all of you that we are broadcasting this live on Facebook. So if you're hurriedly feeling like you need to take more and more notes, just sit back, relax. Let's get to the Q&A portion of the program now. And when you get home tonight, 
feel free to share our Facebook post on our KSL News Radio Facebook page. Hi, Facebook. Uh, with your friends and family. Uh, message them the, the link. Uh, I think everybody can learn so much from what Dr. Uh, Woolley was sharing with us uh, this evening. The Q&A portion, here's how it's going to go. We're going to have a microphone here, obviously, and a microphone up there, and we want to invite you to uh, start asking your questions. And listen, we're radio people. We get uncomfortable with, like, three seconds of silence. So, I mean, we're going to let it happen, though. We're going to let it happen. We'll just sit here in silence until someone stands up. So uh, please feel, feel free right now uh, to, to line up. And let's, let's start that conversation because, uh, uh, Dr. Woolley, I, I loved the role play here, <laughs> how that conversation went. It was so creepy how accurate it was <laughs> that it's a little disconcerting. So uh, please come down. Uh, let's start that conversation. Oh, it looks like we have somebody. Thank you for taking one for the team. Go ahead. So my question is... Yeah, come on down. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about development um, and screen time. Just like mental development, social development, that kind of thing, and uh, correlating sure. that with screen time. So like some neuropsych talk, what sure. happens to your brain? Yes. Can you fry it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so her question has to do with brain, brain and probably emotional and behavioral development and screen time. Um, that's a little tricky in the sense that people are very different and some people are more prone to having problems from that than others. However, one thing to keep in mind is that um, current understanding of neurodevelopment is up until about age 24, you have a lot of myelination happening. You're not necessarily growing new brain cells, but you're connecting and making certain pathways um, in your brain, and your brain is learning to operate. One way to think about it is it's downloading software all the time. Right now I'm losing software because I'm almost 50, but you're downloading software when you're a teenager. So there are some problems with being unidimensional in what you do in general. If a kid is just sitting, looking at a screen all the time, unidimensional, that can be problematic in the neural pathways that are being created. Um, there are also some, back when I was a teenager, they were worried a little bit about, uh, does anybody remember the MTV effect? What was, what was different about MTV compared to every other bit of TV? Music, uh, music and video. But more than that, short, boom, 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 boom. It was, they were thought, teaching people to be ADHD. And in fact, there's a little bit of evidence to that if you're an adolescent learning how to flip through things. I think I've become a little bit of a victim of that through the internet, because the internet is way more MTV than MTV ever was. At least MTV, you'd have like three and a half minutes of Van Halen, right? But in the internet, especially social media, it's just flip, 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 flip through things. And so that's, if you're an adult with a fully functioned brain, uh, formed brain, I should say, <laughs> I don't know about functioning, but formed, um, then you uh, are going to deal with that a little bit better. It might just be an impulse control. But actual wiring of your brain can happen during those developmental periods where you have a really hard time staying with anything for very long. That's why one of the protective factors that I had up there was read books. Reading books requires imagination, slowing down. Um, one other quick comment that I get a lot on screen time and neurodevelopment is it is very stimulating to a young brain. And so bedtime, I recommend, if we can get away with it, two hours before going to bed, screens are off. Okay, now that's, everybody laughed, right, inside, because I didn't hear it. But outside... How long was that? You, what was that number? Two hours. Now, how many of us... Now, Debbie talked about how great was it, Debbie, to have the phones out of the bedroom. It was really good, right? And I'm as guilty as anybody, but the reality is, especially for your kids, helping... If they have a sleep problem, one of the very first things you ought to ask yourself, how, long, how much screen time are they using before bed? Do they have screens in their room? Are you strong enough to fight them? Those are the three, just the first two. Okay. Thanks. I hope I answered that question. What's next? 
Test. There we go. So you pointed out the 22%, which is a spike uh, from... Higher uh, than the national average. Higher than the national suicidal average. Suicidal thoughts, yeah. I was interested to know your, your belief as to why that is high and um, the, the research about the Rocky Mountain, the, the altitude interests me, your thoughts on whether or not that's a factor, and then possibly some of the cultural aspects of, of this culture. And so that yeah. interests me. Yeah, the Mountain West, thank you. So if I understand your question, Mountain West has a higher than average teen suicide rate. And in that particular statistic we looked at, it was a suicidal behavior, which could be an active suicidal thought or an attempt. So kind of bringing those together for that stat. Your question is why, right? And I think you said something about altitude. I feel better in San Diego. I don't know. Maybe that's it. Um, uh, I'm not familiar with any research that's cr very robust, I should say, about altitude being a particular issue. I will say that one of the issues that may be as simple as what we're doing tonight is helping correct that, and that is it isn't talked about as much or as openly as it may be in other areas that have lower rates. So having an open dialogue and a discussion within your family about mental health issues uh, is a very important thing, and that could be a helpful corrective factor. Uh, another one is we have, I'll be honest with you, and it's not a bad thing, but it may have a negative side effect. We have a high expectations for kids in the Mountain West. There is a lot of expectation to go to college, be a high achiever, and do things that are external as opposed to starting with understanding your child first. One of the things that I think does reflect and validate that statement is the fact that we in the Mountain West have had a, a huge explosion of the gap year. Do you, do you know what the gap year is? What's the gap year? Yeah, take a year off between high school and college. Yeah, my dad would have called that lazy. There's no way I was getting a gap year, right? You don't get a gap year, you go do something, get out of the house, okay? I think one of the reasons that in the Mountain West we have such a high rate over the last five to 10 years of more gap years, kids getting accepted to college, but then requesting deferment, is because they need some time to maybe slow down and process who they are and what they want to be. When I went to college, they didn't ask me to already declare my major before I left Morgan, Utah. But what do, what do we do to them now? Like, I, do you think I wanted to be a shrink when I was 18? I, had, I didn't know what a psychologist was. That would have been kind of weird, right? Somebody, Emily asked me that beforehand. Did you always want to be a psychologist? I'm like, no, I think I wanted to be an astronaut or a spaceman or something. I don't know. Um, but I think that high expectations without support. So let me finish my thought. High expectations are not bad. High expectations can be a very good thing. But high expectations without understanding of your child and without the right support can be overwhelming to them. And that seems to be one of the cultural factors that may be operating there with that number. But I'll be honest with you, if you can figure out exactly why we're higher than everybody else, you, you should write a book because everybody wants to know. We're all kind of grasping at the research right now. Good question, though. Okay, so I've been wanting to know this for a while as I see more people with these diagnoses of anxiety. Yeah. How do you balance that, you know, recognizing this is anxiousness you're feeling or this is anxiety, how do you balance that with using it as a crutch or a label? Well, I have anxiety. I can't go to that activity. You know what I mean? Like, right. I just, I see that in my own family and I wonder how to balance that. So, excuse making, right? right. Yeah. So, um, I think one of the things that we want to do typically with kids and adolescents is we look for the manifestation of the disorder of any type in at least two to three settings. So, if it's like school, I don't want to go to school, that's the only time they, that every, otherwise they're totally happy to be out doing stuff, then you might want to investigate further. So if they're having anxiety of a social nature, I don't want to go to that activity because I can't do it, then two things need to be investigated. One would be, are we seeing this pattern in other settings? Because if it's um, kind of an organic anxiety that they're chronically dealing with, you will see it in more than one setting. The other thing is that's a golden opportunity to have a great, insightful conversation with your kid. They may have some good reasons that they're not expressing to you about why they don't want to be there. Uh, bullying, feeling awkward, not having skills. Something as simple as, I remember 
talking to a sixth grader, so kind of a pre-adolescent 11, 12-year-old time, and he would not go out at recess. He would just stand up next to the building, and he had anxiety about going out, and he didn't really understand how to express it. Anyway, after a long time, we got around to the fact that he didn't, everybody, all the cool kids or whatever, uh, they played basketball. The cool guys that he wanted, they played basketball at recess. And he didn't know any of the rules or how to play basketball. He'd never touched a basketball. He'd never held a basketball. To be honest, it wasn't just teaching the kid basketball, which was fun therapy. Um, it was also helping him then use coping skills to calm himself down, go out, ask if he could play. But quickly, he kind of got over that, and that anxiety that he had was fairly situational. Um, many people are predisposed to something like anxiety, so you look at your family history. Uh, you may find anxiety or, more accurately, behaviors. Avoidance is a hallmark behavior of anxiety. Uh, you name a type of anxiety, we could play a fun game that only I would find fun, and I could tell you how people avoid in that type of anxiety. All right? um, avoidance is often uh, happening. If you see that, you can investigate it further. If they only don't want to go on test day, then your kid's just working you. Uh, I haven't heard the word grandparenting where you have full nest. And in our society, it's pretty prevalent for many grandparents to be assisting uh, their young, ad young adults sure. uh, assisting in raising their children, and it is a challenge. <laughs> it is. Uh, you've raised your own, and now you're trying to do your best with grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And grandchildren uh, can often be quite resistant to grandparenting because they think we're old, old and don't understand today's things and what's really great and what's really cool and and we obviously have lived longer and have had more life experience so I think we're even more sensitive to today's issues and uh, I think you've addressed a lot of things very well but I haven't heard anything about grandparenting and full nest could you Shed a little light on that for us, please. Sure, yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. You're right. I, um, Thank you. Hadn't, yes, thanks for that question. I hadn't planned on talking about grandparenting, but let's talk about it. Because you're right, there are a high number of kids that are partially or fully uh, being raised on a regular basis by their grandparents. And so one of the things that I see happening uh, that would be very helpful there is grandparents, you mentioned, they sometimes don't want to do what grandma or grandpa says. And that's usually because roles are not clearly defined. And so if you are a parent who's relying on one of your parents or a grandparent to help raise the children part-time or full-time, I think one of the things that you need to do is sit down, discuss what are the boundaries, what are the expectations uh, between the grandparent and the grandchild, and then bring the kids into that conversation so that they understand, you know, if grandma asks you to X, Y, and Z, that's the same as if I've said it. And here... Here are the rewards for doing it, and here are the consequences for not doing it, et cetera. Um, so I think one of the things that happens is kids just get dumped off with grandma and grandpa, and grandma and grandpa want to have fun and relate with the kids, but the kids may be acting out in some of their typical ways and, but not responding to grandma and grandpa. And so role definition is huge and often makes a big difference. Yeah. So on behalf of somebody else who doesn't want to stand here at the mic. Um, can you give some suggestions on an adolescent level of how they, can, how they might be able to communicate better with a parent who's really resistant, specifically in a single parent home? Um, gradually that communication is becoming more and more toxic and the relationship is, is wedging further and further apart. So some suggestions on how they might be able to do that. Sure. So if I understand what you're saying, it's kind of a role reversal here, where you have a teenager who needs to communicate with the parent, but the parent's kind of resistant mm -hmm. to that communication. Yeah. yeah. So that's really tough. Okay? Teenagers and parents have what we call a power differential. right? Just like when the officer who's 20 pulls me over, he's got more power than me. right? So I'm going to take the ticket and smile. <laughs> um, parents have a, have a power differential with their children. And so 
we, we really can try to empower teenagers to use a lot of the same things like I statements and reflective listening. In my office, we do a whole lot of role playing, probably more than people want to do, where we talk about how can you express yourself. Dad, when you do that, it makes me feel like this. Or I feel this way when this happens. That's one area. Another area is trying to identify another adult that can speak maybe more on an adult level with the parent who's having issues of resistance. Parents, life is difficult. And um, one of the things that I've really learned a lot about this year doing the podcast Project Recovery with Casey Scott is just how difficult it is for parents who are struggling with a substance abuse disorder. And many of those things, until they come out, um, nobody has any idea. So a parent may be struggling with their own mental health. They may be struggling with employment, being underemployed, all these stressful things, and therefore they become difficult, resistant, or rigid in their parenting. So sometimes training that, that adolescent, if they have been using I statements, if they have tried their best to communicate their needs and it's not happening to a parent, then having that teenager find another adult family member who can maybe advocate for them and talk with the parent. Have there been any studies done uh, regarding uh, children and exercise and their propensity to have the anxiety or suicide disorders? I've been kind of shocked that uh, they don't require a PE anymore, and maybe that would aid something. do it online. Me, but, um, <laughs> it's true. I, I mean, I, I, have there been studies done on that that show a direct correlation between lack of exercise and depression? Yes, but those of us that really are into exercise, it's not as satisfying as we would hope. What we do know is this. If a person is depressed or they're struggling with a lot of anxiety and other important areas of their life are healthy, that's going to improve how they're functioning. Now, that usually does not cure a real problem with major depression or a, a, a real anxiety disorder. Uh, what we do know is that on those studies that we, the graphs that I showed, the more sedentary hours of screen watching. It's not just looking at a screen. Like, none of your kids are doing this when they're watching a screen. They're just sitting down, right? And so lack of exercise, lack of endorphins, those sorts of things that can come with exercise improve moods and help a lot. And we can see that the longer they sit, the worse their moods get. So that's why I say balance. Physical activity is really important in that balance. Um, I'm hedging my response just a little because one of the things that I'll just be honest because we're all friends now, right? Here in the trust tree. <laughs> the trust tree always gets a laugh. Um, that irritates the crud out of me when people just say, all you got to do is exercise. You won't be depressed. I exercised. I'm fine. <laughs> okay, so it's not, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. If your kid's not exercising, they're going to be more depressed. If they're depressed and they exercise, it'll help. But it's not the cure-all. But it, it's definitely part of it. Okay. Well, you took the words right out of my mouth, what I was going to say about it. it makes me feel good. No, the, the thing that I have noticed is that as makes I have aged... Makes me feel good, too. Wheels. We've got to do wheels. And I don't, I don't... I'm not an exercise maniac, but I do have found that as I have aged, and I don't know if it was the same way when I was young, that my propensity to feel down or deal with life stresses that naturally come along are much harder to deal with if I haven't at least gone for a brisk walk. Yeah, I think that applies to all ages and maybe especially to kids. Kids have a lot of energy, typically, a lot more than we do. And they need to spend that energy or it can create tension, irritability, easily frustrated, bite your head off kind of stuff. And absolutely, kids should have an opportunity to get outside, exercise. It doesn't have to be in a team sport. Uh, it can be going hiking, going skiing. I was talking to a little guy today. I said, what are you looking forward to? And he can't wait to start skiing with his dad. So he was hoping it snowed. And I, I didn't tell him that I was mad at him for hoping that. But <laughs> I told him that was awesome. So yeah, it, it, we need to do more. A quick follow-up question to that. I had, um, have they found that uh, people who... I don't know, they talk negatively or uh, they have a tendency to take a dim view of their situation or they're, they're kinda, they kind of like talk themselves into being down about it. Is that kind of a habitual thing 
that can develop. Now, I understand that there's a difference between a, a situational depression like a, a death in the family, a divorce or something like that, and then there's a chemical depression that comes on. There is a difference there. But for the one that's not chemical, does a consistent effort with a positive outlook uh, dramatically affect someone's propensity for depression? Absolutely. Thanks for bringing that up. For a cognitive psychologist like myself, just softball. Bam. Okay, let's talk about it. Um, yes, thoughts, feelings, behaviors. One of the things that people get tired of hearing me say is how you think about stuff influences how you feel, how you feel influences what you end up doing. If we talk about two cognitive ends of a spectrum, there's pessimism and optimism. And there is a mountain of research that shows that our pessimistic versus optimistic views of the world have everything to do with how we mediate stressors. And so uh, one of the things, do I have it up here? Yes, here's a good one. I want you to go read this book. The Optimistic Child by Martin Seligman. Martin Seligman's past president of APA. He's the founder of the Positive Psychology Research Center at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the adult version of that book is uh, Learned Optimism. Uh, some people are born a little more optimistic than others. Optimism is highly associated with positivity and in mood and behavior. Pessimism is highly associated with depression in adolescence and adulthood. And regardless of where you're born on that spectrum, if you're a little negative Nelly when you come out, or if you're like super positive, you can learn to be more optimistic. And so I would say if you're interested in that, I would highly recommend reading uh, Learned Optimism and then maybe following up on some of their research at University of Penn. Thanks. Dr. Matt, thank you. Uh, we appreciate everybody coming down. I had an entire uh, KSL News Radio ready to ask questions. You guys saved us all by uh, being prepared. So uh, we only have time. Let's finish up with this line. So, ma'am, uh, in the back, you'll, you'll definitely let's get your question in. Um, but let's finish up with this line because uh, I'm sure you get Dr. Matt running. We can go all night. So uh, let's, we'll, we'll end right there. Okay. So go ahead. We have what, four right, more people? In line. Five more people? We'll, we'll finish everyone's questions, right? That's yeah, right. finish everyone's questions. Okay. My question is about setting limits. I love Debbie's idea of parking the phones at night. At our house, the worst abuser, though, is the 19 year old who's still living at home. Right. He's way overuses screen time, constantly scrolling through his phone. Yeah. But he's 19, so we feel a little bit. We're not quite sure what limits we can set on him and how much we can say, well, he's an adult, I guess. You know. Well, he's, he can also get his own place. He's an adult. <laughs> I mean, so I will say you, you've hit on a really, really important thing to, to think about. I, I uh, didn't quite hang my head, but I have a 21-year-old. He's home for a good reason, sort of. And I have an 18-year-old. And honestly, I love having him at home. But... It's still your house. You have to decide what are acceptable changes and limits to the behaviors that you allow of your adult children living at home. And one way to talk about it is always up front. The worst parenting strategy is, I'm going to hope everything's okay. When there's a problem, I'll deal with it. That's the worst. The best thing is prevention, up front. So if this is your situation, a 19-year-old or a young adult living at home, think about, like, what are my expectations? and ask them to help you help the household run better. Now, I realize that's a little idealistic if you know, they're an anarchist or something, but if you have a reasonable young adult living at home, you can usually sit down with them and say, listen, I want to treat you like an adult, and I hope really someday you act like one and move out. But until then, <laughs> until you do, um, I want you to have some adult freedoms that you didn't have when you were a high school student living at home under 18. However, I also have these other kids, or even if you don't, um, you know, I have to run my life. I need your help in running this household in a smooth way. So here are some of my expectations. Do you, can you agree to these? And so again, bringing them into the conversation, asking them to help instead of, you know, setting limits will happen in that process, but instead of starting with limits, you know, these are the rules. Nobody likes to be told that. And most 19-year-olds today are still like 15 you know, emotionally, and that's, there's research on that. Um, and so you, you do have to realize you may be triggering some unwanted oppositional behavior. Just because they're 18 or 19 or 20 doesn't mean they, they're really ready for all that adult stuff. And so 
but bring them in, draw them in, ask them for help. And then if they really can't do it, then you might have to um, let them know they can also rent their own place. I have a question about a child with autism. So about my, what? A child with autism. So my 15-year-old has high-functioning autism. Um, he tends to self-soothe by using his electronics, yeah. um, but struggles socially. So we're constantly saying, like, put the phone down and go play with your friends, right? Um, the struggle is that most of the kids in the neighborhood play online, and so when he goes over to have social interactions, which he needs, they send him home to play online. Um, suggestions on how to... 15? He's 15, yes. How to help with this, because he needs social interactions, but I get that his friends are all online. Yeah. And so that applies to your son who has high-functioning autism, but it actually applies to everybody's kids. Because if you look at that Goldilocks effect, when kids are not interacting online with friends, they seem to be left out. And so there is a certain amount of interacting online with friends that is typical and healthy at this point in history. Um, for an autistic kid specifically, I highly recommend for parents, at least during the summertime, try to find, you know, like there's the Utah Autism Research Center up at the University of Utah, and there are a variety of other things in town where they may be having uh, opportunities to get together with other teens and practice social skills during the summertime. Uh, they go out, they go to the movies, they go to restaurants, they learn things that might feel intuitive to other 15, 16 year old uh, teenagers. That being said, one of the things I'd recommend you do is sit down with them and talk about the social aspect of what they're doing. Uh, find out like what this awful game that you paid for is that they're playing and what they're doing in it. And the reality is a lot of kids are building social skills that they can adapt to real life situations. For example, if your uh, son has friends that go to school that he plays with online, talk to him about how he's gonna talk at school about those same things. What can he say? It could be something as simple for, for a kid with high functioning autism as, that was a fun game last night. You really played well. You know, that kind of stuff. And they can transition that. Instead of assuming screens are bad or assuming video games are bad, Find out why your kid likes it. You like your kid, right? And you, you know that, that there must be a reason why they like this. There's something good about it. Find out what their connection is to it, and then see if you can work with that. But often, with the online gaming, that's a great way to help them role play with you. Um, my kids love role playing. They like, literally will run out without shoes on in winter if dad says role play. Um, <laughs> But role play with them. How are you going to talk to Steve had so many kills that blah, 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 you know? And it's like, okay, well, how are you going to say, way to go, Steve, at school the next day? Way to go, Steve. That's all. You know, but for a kid, that might be a huge win for their social interaction. And that can lead to the kid, you know, giving them bones or whatever. Well, first of all, thank you for your time, Dr. and KSL, for, for putting this on. It's very informative. I, I have... Um, well, being too personal, I have a couple of kids, <laughs> quite a few of them actually. But um, it's okay. It's trust I, me, I, no judgment. <laughs> I grew all up. Right. At, I grew up in an era of of it was all in your head, right? Um, rub some dirt in it, walk it off, you'll be fine. Walk it off is my favorite. Yeah, and uh, toughen up. Yep. And it wasn't until my my one of my teenagers had depressive behavior, anxiety, and it finally became diagnosed and that I began to realize that this is, this is, this is real. Um, and, it, and I've had a lot of, to do a lot of changing, a lot of shifting of, of my, my thinking. I, I'm still in the process. But I have a second kid who, who is now exhibiting some of the anxiety uh, behavior, a lot of the things that you put on your list. And um, I just, from your, from your advice, what are some things that I can do to, to help cope or, or help my... my kid who's now exhibiting this uh, anxiety, mainly anxiety, um, behavior to, to, to help him out. Okay. So you don't want to go with the walk it off or rub dirt on it? <laughs> yeah. I don't want I've, to learned, that. I've learned. I do better? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? If that's how you're feeling with your own kids, you're not alone. Um, you know, uh, honestly, that's how most of us grew up who are raising teenagers today. A uh, couple of thoughts. One would be you need to get educated yourself about what anxiety is, what depression is. So you're here tonight, you obviously care enough. 
um, find opportunities to read about what causes anxiety. It's an interesting experience from my point of view to ask a parent or ask a teenager uh, who, let's stay, stick with anxiety, they have anxiety, I'll say, why do you have anxiety? Where's that coming from? What is it? That's a tough question, actually. So if we want to be empowered and understand how to fix or improve an issue, I think it starts with education. And we really can't help our kids unless we understand that every single time a person is anxious, there are always three things happening. There's always biology involved. Now, it may not be a chronic genetic predisposition towards anxiety, but your, anxiety, your biology changes as your mood changes. So if you have an acute stressor, they may be having an acute biological reaction. Biology is always part of it. Now you're talking to the PhD guy here, so we don't always have to prescribe medicine, but sometimes medicine has a role. Other times it's a change in things like diet, exercise, sleep, uh, those kinds of things that help our kids uh, with their biological patterns of thinking and patterns of behavior. And so as a parent, if you understand how they, it's not so much the social situation, it's how they think about their social situation that really affects their mood and their anxiety, right? Um, when I was a little kid, I was so shy. I, still, I was old enough, way too old, to be bawling in public. If somebody said, oh, he has cute blue eyes. I was so anxious, I didn't want anybody to talk to me. Um, I relate to that anxiety. Do you know what the difference is now? I just assume you all like me. Over time, you get experiences and things change, and your perception of things change. But as a kid, I still remember that. And I remember my mom just being like, I don't know what to do. I don't know. Um, educating us. The other thing is kind of what we've talked about. Um, if you have a heads up, you've had one child with depression, you have another that's struggling with anxiety, have an open conversation. Teach them, hey, it's not your fault that you have anxiety or depression. It isn't something you've done wrong. You're not being judged for it. And guess what? As a parent, that has to be true before you say it. So if you are judging them for that, you need to work on yourself a little bit before you go talk to your kid about it. Um, in my opinion, it is the parent's job to set the emotional tone in the household. Your kids are screwy little developing you know, balls of carbon, and they are going to follow your lead on a lot of things. If you're lying to them about how you think about their anxiety and depression, then you better not say anything. Get yourself educated, learn about it. Then help them talk to you about it. Help them talk to you about how they feel. Guess what? People often don't recognize they have anxiety or depression. Are you anxious? You know, you're, you know, no, I don't have anxiety. Do you worry about stuff a lot? Well, yeah. Do you, are you nervous, like in social Well, my heart rate goes up and I get all sweaty. Okay. Um, do you think about things at the end of the day when you're trying to fall asleep and you thought about, man, that was so stupid because Heidi, I said that thing and now she'll never like me and she thinks I'm an idiot. Do you ever do that? Yeah. You got anxiety, pal, when we talk about it. Like when we talk about what anxiety is, it's not the same for everybody. Depression, same thing. A lot of people are like, oh, no, I'm not depressed. Okay. Um, do you ever feel really down for almost no reason? Sometimes. You feel like things aren't ever going to work out? Yeah. You know, you get where I'm going. Um, so learning, helping a teenager learn about the emotional vocabulary. Drop the label of anxiety and depression. Talk about how they're feeling. Talk about how they're doing. And frankly, bring it up to somebody like the pediatrician. That's a great place to start. They're a lot more accessible than people like me. And they can often put you in touch with somebody who's outside the family. I said to be educated, but I didn't say be an expert. None of us can be an expert. I have a son with Tourette's. I'm not an expert in Tourette's. I know experts in Tourette's, and guess what? That's who he sees, not me. It's important to help connect with people in our community that can provide things for our kids that maybe we can't for them. Okay. My question is, what do you say to the 13, 14, 15-year-old kids who insist that they're the only ones that have to dock their phones at night or have screen time limits they on are you're plane. the only one i know i am i hear it every day <laughs> sorry i didn't mean to cut you off i'm getting punchy um I, I so know. so what do we say let me let, before you walk away I, I feel bad for interrupting you um what do we say to our our by the way it wasn't an accident that you said like 13 14 year olds Early adolescence, they are the worst, okay? About 11 and a half to like 15, 
that's like prime terror time. That's the worst time to deal with teenagers, right? They get a little better as they get older. And so the question is, how do we talk to them when they say they're the only one that has to turn their phone in at night? That's a good question. Um, I'll tell you, uh, the, the reality is they may not be that wrong, unfortunately. They're not the only ones, but I got burned with my oldest on that. He was in sixth grade, and he used to say to me, Dad, I'm the only one that doesn't have a cell phone. I am the only person in my class at his elementary school. And I was like, don't give me that. Don't, no, don't give me that. My dad was an army captain. I don't have any empathy for that. Don't give me that, okay? Um, I've, I'm working on my parenting, too. And so I was there at the school one day. You can sit down now. I didn't mean to make you sound there. Sorry. Um, I, was, I was at school one day, and I was uh, doing a little thing, pre-field trip, whatever, trying to be a good dad. And I just said, uh, Hey, how many people have a cell phone? Okay. Everybody but two kids raised their hand. Mine was one of them. That's a real story. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I guess he has a point. Um, <laughs> sometimes our kids have a point. When it comes to putting your kids' cell electronics away at night, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because most of us don't do it. Most of us do it infrequently. Um, many of their friends are up late texting, messaging. Nobody texts, by the way. That's just old people. If... Facebook, sorry, and texting, that's us. The kids are on, you know, Snapchat. Um, and that's happening all hours of the night. Uh, what you talk to them about, to answer your question finally, <laughs> is you say, you know what, that may be the case, but here are the reasons why we do it at our house. And you explain why it's important. And you also really need to model that same behavior. If you're going into your bedroom with your laptop and your phone and you're telling your kid to go to bed without theirs, that's gonna be a pretty tough sell. So one of the things I recommend is you just be direct and honest with them. I have some good reasons and here they are. Here are the reasons why we have you plug in your phone at night. I know you may be mad at me. By the way, there's no way to not have your 13 or 14 year old mad at you, okay? Um, <laughs> it's. So it's just going to happen, acceptance therapy, and just move on. But that's, that's usually the way we handle it, try to handle it at my house. I'm like, yep, but that's how we do it, and here are the reasons why. I respect you, that's why I'm telling you, but that's what we're doing. Dr. Matt Woolley, thank you so much. A huge round of applause.